Today, I'm going to uh, talk to you about everyone's favorite subject, obedience. Oh, great. That's good. You, yeah, I'll just give you a quick breather in case you want to leave. Uh, yeah, off you go. You can't leave. You're hosting. Um, yeah, I was... Now, I, I was... I came to this subject in particular because I was reading through the book of Hebrews, which is a wonderfully fascinating book about how Jesus fulfills the role of the high priest, how he kind of slots in and does everything that the high priest in, under the Israeli, uh, Israeli covenant, the Mosaic covenant couldn't do, and how he becomes a high priest for us. And I just want to read the passage that piqued my interest out to you. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, today I've become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That's a really fascinating passage. And Christian faith is full of peculiar ideas and concepts that people over the centuries have tried hard to get their minds around. One of them is the concept that there's a man called Jesus who was also God. That's quite a strange concept. It's very, very hard to get your head around. And for centuries, people have struggled with that, and they've argued about it. What does it mean? And they've tried to describe the indescribable. And I don't think that's going to change this side of the kingdom of God, because we just don't have the language for it. We don't have the grid. And there's another truth embedded in this passage, which is similar in fashion. And that is, Jesus, God's Son, learned obedience. I can't get my head around that. How is it that Jesus, the Son of God, had to learn obedience? And that piqued my interest. And the Bible is chock full of stories about people, ordinary people, people who are obedient and disobedient, and what happens to them as a result of their obedience and their disobedience. And obedience and disobedience are found throughout the Bible right from the beginning, right through to the very end. We see Adam and Eve struggling with obedience and failing, and we all know the consequences of that. Think of the story of Abraham. He was an interesting guy. Obedient to God when called to go somewhere. He had no idea where he was going. 
he was told by God to leave the house of his father, and he obeyed. And then he was given a promise by God, a promise that one day he would have a son and that he would have descendants, as many as the stars in the sky. But he was old, and his wife Sarah was old, and he couldn't see how this could happen. So he got impatient, and he tried to make it happen for himself. And he had a son called Ishmael with his slave, Hagar. But that wasn't God's promise. And he learned his lesson there, And latterly, God asked him to do something very, very hard. When Isaac was born, his only son, he said, go and sacrifice your son. At that juncture, Abraham's faith sprang to life again, and he was obedient to what God asked him to do. Of course, God stayed stayed his hand, and Isaac lived. And as a result of that act of obedience, Abraham became the father of faith, for the entire Jewish nation, but not only for them, but for you and I as well as Christians. In Hebrews, Abraham is said to be our father. Think of Samson. He's a bit of a basket case, really. Completely self-obsessed. He just couldn't get it right. God gave him a clear instruction But he thought it was all about him. He thought the story was about him. And so he focused all of his efforts on pleasing himself. And although at the end of his life, he asked God for the pleasure of bringing the temple down on the Philistines, it wasn't a glorious end to one's life. And there was a lot of disobedience there. But these stories are there for you and I to learn from. And they're terrific. And what I love about the scriptures is that they don't pull their punches. They tell you the gory details. And those details are there for us to reflect on. Because we suffer from the same temptations and the same things as those people did. We're no different. Just because we have Tesla cars and Apple watches and computers and things like that, human nature is exactly the same as it was then. And then think about Moses. Under the Old Covenant, things were fairly straightforward for Israel. They were given a law, and it was quite clear. God said, here we are. Here's the blessings for obedience. And here we are. Here are the curses for disobedience. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Nice, clear set of rules to follow. But for Moses, it was a little bit more complicated. And it was more complicated because he had a different relationship with God. He had an interpersonal relationship with God. He was God's friend. He knew God face to face, one on one, in a way which the Israelites didn't. And as a result of that came more responsibility. Because Jesus says that to those whom much is given, much is expected. And I think that is in relation to our, the way we relate to God as well. And so I think Israel and Moses is an interesting model for us to learn something about obedience. So in spite of its apparent complexity, the law under the old covenant is very straightforward. It's a set of rules, and we like rules. Rules are great because, you know, we can understand them. And we need to obey a lot of rules in life, don't we? You know, take the highway code. If you jump a red light, you're going to get into trouble. And that rule is there for a reason. And we kind of obey that rule. And if you jump a red light and a police officer stops you and he says, why did you jump that red light? And you say, well, red lights, they're just not for me. It's not going to go down well. The rules are there for a reason, and we kind of obey them. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Job, that's another fascinating story. Job's friends couldn't square 
the catastrophic situation that Job was in with the idea that he hadn't done something wrong. Because in their mindset, there were blessings for obedience and there were curses for disobedience. But we know because as readers of the book of Job, we have the inside track on what the real story was and they were wrong. And at the end of the story, Job is vindicated. And God gives his friends a bit of a ticking off for their presumption. And that's very interesting. And in Jesus' lifetime, that idea that if you were rich, you must have been a really good person. And if you were poor, you must have been a really bad person. It was rife cast in stone in Jewish society. And there's an interesting story in Luke 13 where Jesus takes that head on. The story goes about that time, Luke says, some people came up to Jesus and told him about some Galileans that Pilate had killed while they were worshipping. And Pilate had mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrifices. And Jesus responded, and he says, do you think those murdered Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Not at all. But unless you turn to God, you will also die. And those 18 in Jerusalem the other day, you know, the ones who were crushed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse citizens than other people in Jerusalem? Not at all. And unless you turn to God, you too will die. And I think that's really interesting because the people who are questioning that were looking for the rules. In their mind, if you did, you know, if something bad happened to you, it was because you were a bad person. If something good happened to you, it was because you were a good person. And Jesus says, not at all. That isn't how it works. And the reason that we like these kind of rules is because they make it easy to predict how life is going to go. It's good to draw conclusions. If this, then that. If I give more money to the church, God will bless me financially. The reason that person is still sick is because we didn't pray hard enough. We've heard these things. Both of those things might actually be true, specifically. But they're not true because we turn them into a law or a rule. And that's the danger that we can face sometimes. That way of thinking is thinking about under the law. But we don't live under the law. We live under grace. That's a very different situation. Jesus doesn't call us servants. He calls us friends. God calls us his children. We live under grace. There are great dangers in assuming that the Christian life is just a set of rules. Assuming that certain outcomes will transpire if we behave in the right way, if we think the right thoughts, if we do the right things. In its mildest form, it leads to a lot of disappointment. Because life isn't as easy as that. And we all know it isn't as easy as that. And Jesus has told us it's not as easy as that. So he recognizes it too. In its most extreme form, it can lead to superstition. It can lead to treating God as a slot machine. If I put the right sum of money in and I pull the handle... God must do this for me. Treating the Lord as a sugar daddy. Now, it's not wrong at all to want answers to life's problems. We all want them. And it's not wrong at all to want easy answers to life's problems. We want those too. But sometimes there aren't any answers. And we have to live with that. And I think that it is at that point when 
you have been obedient to what God has required of you, but it hasn't produced the desired outcome that you wanted. That's the point where the quality of your faith will arise. There's an interesting story in the book of Daniel. You'll be familiar with it. Three guys who came with Daniel into Babylon in the exile. They were intelligent, super intelligent people, very bright. And they got positions in King Nebuchadnezzar's court as advisors. And that's a big deal in a place like Babylon. It was a massive, massive city. Very, very advanced for its time. And some of the advisors, not, the, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who came with Daniel, but some others who didn't really like the Jewish guys, said to Nebuchadnezzar, I think, we think it's a great idea that you build a 60-foot statue of gold, and when the band plays, everyone's got to fall down and worship it. Nebuchadnezzar thought, yeah, that's a great idea. I like that. Let's do that. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were caught not doing that. And some of the advisors told Nebuchadnezzar and said, these guys are not falling down when the band plays. They're not worshipping the statue of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar calls them in and says, is it right that um, you're not falling down and worshipping when the band plays? Why aren't you doing that? And they say, well, we don't need to defend ourselves to you, O king. But we will not bow down to any statue made of gold. So the king gets pretty shirty about it and says, right, you're going in the furnace. That's a pretty serious deal, to be thrown into a furnace. And he says, what do you think about that? And they say, okay. If you throw us in the furnace, then God will rescue us. But we want you to know this, that even if he doesn't rescue us, we're still not going to bow down. And that is the point where the quality of their faith arises. And I find that really exciting. And there's a kind of parallel to that in my brain. It's a bit weird, but it's a parallel to it where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, we kind of see a similar spiritual battle going on, where Jesus prays fervently. This is the reference, I think, in Hebrews 5, that he was heard because of his reverent submission. But he wasn't saved from death. He asked God to save him from death. Please, if it's possible, can you take this away? He was heard because of his reverent submission, but the answer was no. And the quality of his relationship came out when he said, not what I want, but what you want. So, looking again at Israel and Moses, I think that there are two general areas. There are two areas of, of life in which we need to be obedient. And the first is general obedience, which doesn't sound very exciting, but I think it covers everything to do with being a new creation, what it means to be transformed from being dead in our sins to being alive in Christ. That whole process, the process of being adopted into God's family, that can be quite complicated. While I was doing this, I felt the Lord say to me, have a look at some stuff to do with what it means for children to be adopted into a new family. This is not an area of my expertise whatsoever. But I did a little bit of reading. And one of the things I found out, unsurprisingly, was that some children who are adopted into a new family carry with them an enormous amount of trauma, hurt, pain, disappointment, frustration. 
maybe even medical problems. They carry that with them into their new family. And those things have to be processed over time in order that they can become adopted into that family and play their full part and feel like they belong. And that's true of us as well. As we are adopted into God's family, we often bring our past hurts and traumas and disappointments and all of that kind of stuff. And we need to process those things as well so that we don't get a twisted view of God. I just want to quickly plug. At Kingsgate, we run a seven-week course that's headed up by Paul Harper called Adopted. And it's designed for this very purpose, to help people to, who have become Christians, and not necessarily just if you're a new Christian, help anybody to bridge between the old and the new, to come into the new and to live in the fullness of being an adopted child of God and to get everything out of that, your full inheritance that Christ bought for you on the cross. I want to plug that. If you're interested in that, please speak to me afterwards or look on our website on the Kingsgate Church website because you'll see some information about adopted on there. General obedience is for all of us. None of us get us away with that. Um, A quick summary of general obedience can be found, I think, in the brilliant two pastoral letters written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. One and two Timothy. They're only short, but they're really nice and pithy, and they contain a terrific amount of useful stuff about what it means to go from the old life to the new. Because Paul is writing to Timothy, who he has discipled and left him to start running a church. And Timothy's a young guy, probably in his early 20s. And he's got to run a church in a, an environment that's very, very secular, very, very full of superstition and strange ideas and things like that. And somehow he's got to promote the gospel in that. And Paul writes these letters to help him to do that. And they're fascinating. Then there's specific obedience. So general obedience is for all of us. Specific obedience is just for you and just for me. Because your relationship with God is unique, as is mine. None of us can have anyone else's relationship with God. And in the specific areas of life, God requires you and me to be obedient in certain things. And they won't be germane or relevant to anyone else necessarily. And I think in, it's most often in the area of specific obedience that we can hold ourselves hostage, hostage to certain outcomes if we're not careful. And we end up in what-if scenarios, you know, God told me to take this job, but what if I take it and it doesn't work out? I think God's told me to plant a church, but what if I plant a church and nobody turns up? I think, I speak to my wife and I think God has told us to give a lot of money to that person. But what if we end up with no money ourselves? What are we going to do? And moral philosophers classify these kind of dilemmas by talking about two different approaches. There's a consequentialist approach. That is where one looks at the consequences or the outcome, and you base your judgment or your approach to the issue based on what you think the outcome will be. That's a kind of I give money to the church, God's going to bless me financially. That's the outcome. And then there's a categorical approach, and that is the approach to life which is based on principle. And I think that's where we belong. I think we belong in the categorical camp where 
we act out of principle, we act out of faith, we act because God has told us to be obedient in something, irrespective of what the outcome is. We trust God for the outcome, and it might not be the outcome that we want. And that's where the rubber hits the road. But pursuing that kind of obedience frees us from the petty terrorism of what-if scenarios. It plants us like a tree beside still waters because we put our trust in the Lord and say, I'm going to do this because you've told me to. I don't know what the outcome will be, but I'm leaving it with you. Our obedience cannot come with strings attached. So how can we walk in obedience without being a prisoner to desired outcomes. I'm going to give you three suggestions. They're not groundbreaking. They're not surprising. The first is good news because the Bible tells us that he has already given us everything we need for life and godliness. So you already have everything that you need to be equipped to live that kind of life, which is great news. So you don't have to go and do a whole load of extra stuff to get into that place. Of course, what I find in my life is that if I'm obedient in small things, it just gets easier and easier to be obedient in bigger things and more obedient, and you kind of get used to it. If I'm disobedient in the small things, it's easier to excuse the bigger things, and you kind of slide this way. So obedience needs to be practiced. If Jesus had to learn obedience, we do, for sure. The second thing, oh, haven't finished with the first thing. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, by the way. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is another counselor. He's the closest friend you're ever going to have. He's the wisest counselor you're ever going to speak to and ever going to receive instruction from. Get to know the Holy Spirit. Involve him in every decision in your life. Christine's brilliant at that. I'm terrible at it, so I've got lots to learn. But even in the small decisions, because every decision can be a place of blessing. Secondly, get to know how God thinks about life. Well, how do I do that? Scriptures are full of it, full of how God thinks about life. I want to challenge you to think about reading through the Bible once in a year. Just once, maybe once in your lifetime. There's a very good online website unsurprisingly called oneyearbible.com. <laughs> Highly recommended. It's very, very good. You go through the Bible, you can go through the Bible in the same way as we would in an English Bible. You can go through it also um, in a way which is historical or chronological. And you can go through it in a way which is based on the Hebrew order of the Bible, which is slightly different, the Hebrew order of the Old Testament. There are lots and lots of ways to do it. You can do it once a day. I don't do it every day. <laughs> I'm terrible at this. Um, but I'm sure over about the 10 years that I've been trying to do this, I must have read the Bible through at least once. You know, it's, it doesn't suit everyone. I know it you know, it doesn't suit Christine. She has other ways of doing things, and that's fine. But it's a good thing to do because it gives you a sweep of the narrative. You know, that's helpful. Another really helpful thing to do with the Scriptures is listen to them. Yeah? Audio Bibles are brilliant. So I use an audio Bible when I go to work on my motorbike. I tune in, listen to the dulcet tones of David Suchet reading Romans. Wonderful stuff. Yeah, it's great. Um, and that, I can highly recommend that as well. Yes. My version. <laughs> David Suchet. I think David Suchet has cracked it, actually. 
So, reading the Bible, and there's an interesting, in, in, in Deuteronomy 11, I'm coming into land, don't worry. Um, in Deuteronomy 11, Moses says this to the Israelites, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And that's a wonderful sense of being saturated with the Word of God. And in the Psalms, David says, I meditate on your instruction day and night. It's a wonderful thing to do. And Jesus invites us to abide in him by taking his word in. And one of the interesting things in John 15 is where he talks about pruning in the context of abiding in him. And pruning isn't punishment. Yeah? Think, oh, God's going to prune me. Yeah! It doesn't mean that. God prunes you when he speaks his word to you. That's what Jesus says in that context. He says, you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Pruning is not punishment. As we read the scriptures, as we meditate on God's word, as we hear his voice through the scriptures, he prunes us. Pruning is changing our mind, being transformed from the inside out so that obedience becomes an easy thing, becomes a delight. I delight in your law, David said. And the third thing is share your life with others. We can't walk this journey alone. I know that I often say this, it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine. And it's a hobby horse of mine because, like many people, I've been hurt by the church. I've been a Christian for 40 odd years now and been through several churches and got hurt. But we have to travel this road together. We have to be vulnerable with each other. It's difficult. We don't always get it right. We don't always speak well to each other. We don't always consider one another as we should. But life is a struggle like that. But we are called to do it together. And that's how we learn as well. We learn in the jostle and the mess and the difficulties and the challenges of trying to figure out how to live together, trying to figure out, does it matter that you believe that and I believe this and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Being called is being called to be together. Share your life with each other. Share your struggles with each other. You'll probably find that there's someone else who's thought the same thoughts as you've thought, who's done the same things as you've done, who's said the same things that you've said. You're not alone. Share your life. So I think that probably wraps up what I have to say for today on the topic of obedience. <laughs>